show you any work today. Um, I'm going to show you everything that happens in between. Um, so in 2004, I moved to San Francisco. Um, and the really lovely thing, I think, about moving to a different country is that where at home you become sort of anaesthetized to stuff, I think if you move away, your eyes are really opened and you're super, super sensitive to stuff. Um, so all the kind of mundane wallpaper of, of kind of everyday life, like street signage and packaging, you start kind of noticing. Um, and I was particularly kind of entranced by going down to my local grocery store and coming out with a big brown paper bag full of, of produce. Um, and I found that especially romantic. Um, I think those kind of unfamiliar things like sort of, you know, paper bags in America, whereas we have a lot of plastic bags here, um, they have a weird unfamiliarity, but a familiarity because you've seen a lot of them in movies. Um, so this is Steve McQueen in San Francisco in Bullet in uh, 67, 68, kind of hugging a brown paper bag. Um, at the same time that I moved, um, I started kind of driving for the first time. I had a very long commute, two hours a day, um, down to Silicon Valley, um, there and back, and I would carpool with buddies. And when I wasn't driving, I wanted to do something. Uh, so um, you've got to have a hobby, and I started collecting paper bags. Um, so um, often the, the bag would inform what I stitched on them. So this is obviously a, a pharmacy bag, and I would stitch pills on it. The nice thing about this project in part is that it's all found material, um, so nothing is new. They were all old paper bags, and uh, the thread I bought from a, a big flea market that I got kind of addicted to in um, Alameda, just over the bay, um, or occasionally would buy them off eBay. Um, so again, the, the bag kind of informing what I stitched. So teeth on a sugar bag. Um, this looked kind of like my bathroom floor. Um, it actually had these really cute hexagonal tiles. Uh, so I ended up stitching soap on it. It's actually um, a burrito wrapper. Um, and then donuts. And I found quite often I ended up really liking the back more than the, the front. Um, and when I got home back to, back to London after four years in the States, um, no longer being kind of cramped up in a car um, where sort of used bags were practical, um, I could suddenly use kind of pristine paper. Um, and like I said, having sort of often liking the backs more than the fronts, so I started um, stitching palindromes, so it didn't matter which way you looked at them. Um, this is a whole kind of color exploration, and I, I like that juxtaposition of sort of super tidy against kind of messy. Two homes, um, the Golden State stitched with gold thread, and then the UK, um, X marking the spot of London. So the, these are the th things we're getting kind of more and more involved. Um, at the same time as doing this, I stitched the entire lyrics to Elvis's The Wonder of You um, for my little brother-in-law to give to one of my sisters. Um, and I think that combined with this, my eyes sort of started bleeding and not really. Um, but I wanted to find a way to try and economize because it was so insanely time consuming. Um, so I was trying to find a way to use bigger stitches. Um, and this was one piece. This is called Special Offer, kind of based on those things you see in, in shop windows. And what I like about this is the sort of mathematics of it, is that um, on the right-hand side, you have the back, these two perfect concentric circles, and that's the front on the left. Um, and that last piece, another attempt to sort of do it quicker using sort of longer stitches. So that's, that's all the stitching work. Um, most of the work I'm going to show you is from the last sort of year, year and a half. Some of those earlier bag pieces are a bit, bit older. The next set of stuff um, are a series of photographs I've been taken with a mate of mine who's a still life photographer. Um, we've worked together for probably about 15 years. Um, and I found that um, charity shops are quite a good source of objects to shoot. Um, but more importantly, they're just a really good source of um, of um, ideas. Uh, I, I bought this milk float 
in Oxfam, I think. And then it, the idea just sprung from there to sort of shoot it in a pool of milk and then bought these two things off eBay, the ambulance, which is in fake blood, and um, the oil tanker, which is in black treacle. <laughs> Bought, um, I bought these in, in a bunch of charity shops, uh, their ornaments. I don't quite know where this idea came from. It's sort of alarming. I think I must have been picking up ornaments to find out how much they cost, which is particularly alarming given they're so ugly and I can't believe I was considering buying them. Anyway, it fed into this idea. So that's the bottom and that's the top. Um, I knew I was shooting with Sarah the following day, and so there's very little discussion between us because I think we have a very um, we have a good shared sort of aesthetic and um, the same sort of sensibility for colour. And one night I just sort of went around my flat and collected all sorts of you know junk that I've I have all over my flat over the years. And the following day, took it into the studio and didn't really know what I was going to do with it, and just started sort of stacking it up. Um, and they became these funny little animals. And then it is a very sort of organic process. There's a slightly sort of narrative quality and that these little things, the sort of cupcake things, sort of a look like they're imitating the big thing. Similarly, the sort of little dice look like they're imitating the big stack. And the pins imitating the kind of cappuccino ball-y things at the top. A lot of the ideas come out of very sort of mundane happenings. I, I happen to break a plate at home and that made me think it would be really sweet to kind of mend it in a really inept way. Um, so I just stuck some tape on it and that prompted Sarah and I to buy a whole bunch of sort of white stuff so they're nicely recessive um, and then, then mend the, them in this sort of silly way with different, different tape. Um, Yes, yeah, so sort of thrift stores, uh, charity shops, and um, sort of flea markets are just a really good source of ideas and material. Um, I bought uh, these two jumpers a couple of weeks ago and just sort of chopped holes out of them. Um, I had a very good expression for um, a sort of disparaging comment on things that are effortfully groovy. Um, they described it as wolves on everything, but I think sort of skulls on everything is is a similar vibe. Um, this is called Nude. Um, just looking at that sort of ridiculous generic flesh color, sort of Barbie pink. Um, SARS agent has been sending out the work to various um, ad agencies and stuff as we've done it. And we can track how, how many of those emails are opened. And because it's called Nude, that got opened by everyone. So everything from henceforth will be titled Nude something. Um, every week I buy flowers um, and the, the florist guy always sort of tries to wrap them and I say, you know, I live a couple of, couple of minutes up the road, I really don't need them wrapped and he always sort of insists on doing it and now I've sort of given up but I figured I could do something with the paper that they come in so I started recreating the flowers with the paper that they come wrapped in and then um, Sarah and I shot them on a, on a light box and, and recolored them. But that's become quite a big series. I am a bit of a color obsessive. I'm quite bad at editing it because I love it all. So anything that ends up looking like a rainbow is fine by me. Um, originally, th these were going to be really tight crops originally. Um, but when I started sort of ironing them together to get the colors to kind of melt together, the shape of them was so beautiful, we couldn't, couldn't not use it. And Sarah just entered that into the Association of Photographers, and I think that's, that's just got through. So that's all of my work with Sarah. This is what Drew was talking about. This is uh, my, my ongoing project, Things and People. Um, it's a really simple idea. It's just two images juxtaposed, a person and an object, and then the story of that object. They don't have to be desperately kind of poignant. Sometimes they're really, really silly. Um, and sometimes, you know, they are quite sort of heartfelt and, and sad. But hopefully there is some sort of breadth to the project. Um, it's interesting where this started. My mum has a shop 
and it's 50 years old next year. Um, my elder sister also has a shop and she celebrated the 10th anniversary a couple of years ago. Um, and we produced a book to give to customers and to the press. And um, I said it would be the, the really beautiful thing of, about independent retail is you really know your customers. And my mum has this encyclopedic knowledge of you know, what people bought over the years and, and who they were. Similarly, my, my elder sister. So I said it would be really lovely to shoot a customer for every year that she'd been opened and the object that they, they bought that year. Um, and significantly, the objects are always shot in, in the customer's home. So some of them are sort of, yeah, some of them are 10 years old. Um, but they've taken on this pattern of age and absorbed something of the person who, who owns them by, by them being in their house. Anyway, I love doing that so much. I mean, it's basically just an excuse to be nosy, go around and have a cup of tea, that I thought that project doesn't have to end. So I started doing things and people. Um, this is Rob, who for the longest time would work in his studio in the day, um, and then to make ends meet would work in the local cinema, um, and as a result, really never saw his missus. So every night she would write him a note, not, not desperately poetic, um, you know, sometimes defrost pizza for the kids or whatever it might be and written on the back of an old gas bill but always always I love you and I miss you and he saved every single one. This is my mate M, who sadly her mum died about nine years ago and I think it was really traumatic for the whole family um, especially her dad who as a result of being so uh, devastated I think just couldn't bear to give up anything of their mums to the three daughters Eventually, the elder sis um, managed to get this collection of recipes that their mum had made over 40 years. So it was sort of newspaper cuttings, next door neighbour's cake recipe scribbled down, immaculately typing written ingredients for soup, um, mashed into this spiral bound book. And the elder sis, who does propping for movies, um, reproduced that book for each of her twin sisters. So photocopied the pages and distressed them and, and hand painted the cover. And I, I think um, it, it's just a very beautiful demonstration of the love that their elder sister has, has for each of her twin sisters. Um, this is Sam, um, whose babysitter, Tom, when he was five, Tom was probably about 15, his babysitter would bring um, over his um, obsessive large collection of uh, Star Wars toys. I don't know how long uh, Tom babysat for <gasps> Sam, maybe over five years. And on the final time that he was babysitting, I guess before going to college maybe, um, he gave Sam all of his Star Wars toys and all the vehicles and everything. And they used to make elaborate sets together and stuff. Tom now heads up for Creative and I think is currently making a feature. And Sam is now an editor. So S Sam credits Tom with really um, sort of heightening his interest in film. This is Brenda, um, who started dating Sid when she was 12, he was 15. He was um, uh, the delivery boy in the local grocers where her sis worked. Um, come 1939, he joined up to the RAF. And um, as with all women then, if you have a loved one fighting, they would give you what was called a sweetheart pin. And um, at the same time as Sid went off to fight, um, she got promoted and her boss um, was really a abusive, uh, sort of gropey and horrible. And um, one day her, her pin went missing and the boss confessed that in a jealous rage he'd thrown it out the train window on the way home. Um, Brenda told Sid and he immediately replaced the pin and it was all she could do to dissuade Sid from coming and kind of duffing up the boss. All of Brenda's friends at the time said, oh, that's really, really bad luck all the luck is going to fall out because it's an upside down horseshoe. And a week later they got a letter from Ernie, Sid's brother, saying that Sid had been killed. He was um, a rear gunner on Lancaster bombers and he was 19. Um, this is a bit happier. Um, Hector was hiking on an island in Scotland with his dad. They did half the hike and then Hector figured, okay, I'm going to take the coastal route back. And his dad said, okay, I'll see you back at the boat. I'm going over the top of the island. And on the way along the seashore, Hector found an antler. He um, was very excited to get back to his dad and show him. And of course, his, his dad had also found a 5 tined antler on, on his way back. 
Uh, my niece, Nancy, whose uh, first word was Baba, as in blackberry, not after her PDA, but um, she was fed blackberries from the hedgerows from an early age. And she was only just over one for her second Christmas, and it's so boring for little kids. They don't know what's going on, and I figured I wanted Nancy to know what she was unwrapping. So um, I bought a jumper from Oxfam and made that blackberry, and then, of course, I ran out of purple wool, so I had to finish it off with a, a moth-eaten red scarf. <laughs> Um, I won't go through the stories of all of these, we haven't really got time, um, but here's a few more. This one's my favourite. My mate Chris was down the pub with a bunch of mates and um, a friend pulled out this crisp and we were like, oh my god, that's your doppelganger. <laughs> um, a couple of years later, Chris moved to New York and uh, I think he was there for maybe six years. He took the crisp with him. Um, he's now back in the UK. He's had the crisp for 12 years. Um, this is the last project I'm going to show you. It's the biggest thing I've ever done, sort of physically really big, um, and there's quite a lot of components to it. I shot this maybe a month ago um, when I only had one bike. I've now got five. Um, I've now got five rotary washing lines, lots and lots of shirts bought from various charity shops. That's Dan, that's Dan, and one plaid deer stalker. So it's, it's for a festival called End of the Road, which is um, the kind of beard and plaid shirt festival to end all beard and plaid shirt festivals. Um, I don't really know where this idea came from, except I've been to the festival about three years running, um, and I just did this very crude animation, my first movie. Scorsese's shaking in his boots. Um, and this sort of tracks the, the whole process, so it's very lovely to have a totally silly idea and then actually make it. So the top left are the little paper shirts I made for that animation which I then pitched to end of the road sketches that were done by the down down the pub with a bunch of engineer mates and then these fantastic friends of mine Nick Simon and Paul sort of translate it into a, a 3d render a bunch of receipts from Oxfam these are the people from eBay and Freecycle that um, I found the washing lines through. Um, significantly, um, it's just about repurposing as much stuff as possible and again, not buying anything new. Um, a kid's bike that I just bought off a guy and walked it all the way back from Old Street and got lots of funny looks and just told people I'd washed it and it shrank in the wash. Um, and that's Sai with our first prototype in my garden. That's it. Thank you.